Welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to discuss comparative advantage and trade. So let's dive right into the material. So in today's lesson overview, what we're going to do is we're going to identify how trade and specialization leads to gains for an individual or an economy. We're going to compare between a market economy and a command economy. We're going to differentiate between absolute and comparative advantage. And then we're going to create a comparative advantage table in order to find the lower opportunity cost. And we also examine finally how international trade makes both rich and poor nations uh, even richer. So that's the lesson overview. So uh, let's move right along here. So the basic economic concepts that's found uh, in the College Board syllabus here is that students need to be able to differentiate between absolute and comparative advantage to identify comparative advantage from differences in opportunity costs and to apply the concept of comparative advantage in order to determine the basis under which mutually advantageous trade can take, be, uh, take place between countries here. So again, if you look at this whole idea, the, the more important of the two advantages between absolute and comparative, notice here that comparative advantage here is used one, two, three times there, whereas absolute advantage here is only mentioned that, that one time here. So it's good to know what absolute advantage is, absolutely, but comparative advantage is really what the basis of mutually beneficial trade is. So trade and specialization. So the father of modern economics, and that would be uh, Adam Smith, in, in Wealth of Nations, uh, he wrote a, an excerpt here uh, in 1776, which is the most famous document written in 1776, which is the Wealth of Nations. He writes about the benefits of specialization. Now this page is uh, over a thousand pages, so obviously this section is, is really um, just a, a snapshot of what Adam Smith is talking about, but it really highlights the, the point of why specialization is important. So one man draws out the wire, another straights it, uh, a third cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head. To make the head requires two or three distinct operations. To put it on is a particular business. To whiten the pins is another. It is even a trade by itself to put them into the paper. And the important business of making a pin is, in this manner, divided into 18 distinct operations. Those 10 persons, therefore, could make among them upwards of 48,000 pins in a day. But if they had all wrought separately and independently, they certainly would not, each of them, have made 20, perhaps not one pin in a day. So what Adam Smith observed is that if an individual is adamant about making a simple thing like a pen, or a, a simple thing like a pin, it, it might not even be enough to, to make 20, uh, or maybe even one in one particular day. But in the process of breaking down and specializing and exploiting comparative advantage, uh, you can see that the, the total amount could be as much as 48,000 pins. So what we're, we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of break down how that actually happens. Uh, one video actually, one documentary that you can watch on YouTube is that there's a six minute documentary that we see a modern day example of what Adam Smith wrote in Wealth of Nations. So in this uh, documentary called uh, Eye Pencil, I recommend that you uh, maybe pause this video and watch it and return, is that you, you see the specialization that happens in, in making a pencil. So each part of a pencil is made from these different countries and no one country is really capable of making uh, the pencil because it would just be too cost prohibitive and uh, the pencil takes uh, so many different stages. So you see the beauty of a free market economy and uh, letting individuals uh, come, to, uh, come to the marketplace and you see the beauty of, of the free market and the invisible hand of Adam Smith uh, coming together and making a pencil. And so what is this market economy? So in a market economy, production and consumption decisions are the result of decentralized decisions made by individuals and firms. So whether you buy a pencil, whether you, you, you purchase a textbook, whether you buy a movie or, or a DVD, these are decisions that are made individually by, by people, not forced upon by government. And for the most part, uh, we, we have a free market economy in, in a lot of countries. Uh, there's not a lot of government in interference in, in a lot of areas in our life. 
At the same time, uh, there's something called the command economy, uh, which is industry is publicly owned and the government makes decisions on the allocation of goods and services. So in a command economy, rather than individuals making these decisions on what to buy and purchase, it's a government that actually makes these decisions. Uh, the most notable example would be North Korea. North Korea, uh, the, the government has a huge say in economic decisions. So there are very few economies in, in this day and age where the government is completely controlling the economy, but uh, the idea that the government takes control, that's a command economy, whereas if the individuals make individual decisions, then that's more of a free market economy. The reality is that most economies are mixed. So specialization and trade are, are what makes uh, a country prosper. And so most economies will have uh, a bent towards a market economy with some elements of a command economy. And really, uh, it really depends on, on where you're at. For example, uh, a lot of the European countries might might tend towards the side of, uh, of a command economy as far as the government uh, intervening in, in certain areas, whereas maybe an economy like Hong Kong will veer on the side of it being more of a market economy. So again, each country has a, a different degree in which the government is involved. So absolute advantage. What is absolute advantage? It's, it's exactly how it sounds. So a country or individual is simply better than another country or individual in producing a particular product. So let's take a look at a, a country and, and use actual numbers here for this example. Here. So let's take a look at China and Mexico, an economy of toys and t-shirts. So China can either make 50 toys or 100 t-shirts, and Mexico can either make 50, 25 toys or 60 t-shirts here. So the question here, given their production capabilities, is who has absolute advantage in toy production? Well, uh, it's quite simple here. You, you take a look at, at these numbers here, and it's pre pretty clear cut here. So China can make 50 toys, and Mexico can make 25 toys. So if it's a matter of simply absolute advantage, then China. China has absolute advantage. Why? Uh, China because, now again, there's no uh, explanation here in this question, but it doesn't hurt to say that because 50 is greater than 25. You're just simply absolutely better. It, it actually makes sense, right? So China has absolute advantage in toy production. It's really easy. One example I give to students in my class, uh, usually there might be a basketball player, and I ask, who has absolute advantage in playing basketball? Kobe Bryant? or you know the student in my class and 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 usually the student in the class will will defer and, and say you know Kobe Bryant is, is better um, you know having uh, played what would would uh, would amount to be maybe 20 unprecedented years with one team you know Kobe Bryant would have absolute advantage right and uh, that's an easy way of, of getting students to understand who has absolute advantage just simply who's better whether it's individually or as a country here now the second exam or the second question is again really simple here. Uh, 100 t-shirts versus 60 here. So who has absolute advantage in t-shirt production? Again, the no-brainer right here. China. China because once again 100 is greater than 60. So uh, I went over the explanations on why absolute advantage simply means because you're better, you can produce more. But the problem is the world doesn't work uh, in a vacuum. We're, we're dealing with opportunity costs. So the concept of opportunity cost is still going to be present uh, pretty much in, in all these lectures. So when you choose to do something, you're giving up production of something else. So that's really the idea. So absolute advantage, you know, it, it is good to know who has absolute advantage, who's better, but it doesn't really give you a whole lot of practical value. So comparative advantage is what we're looking for. We don't really care about who makes more, but what is the opportunity cost? And so comparative advantage is a country or individual that has a lower opportunity cost than another country or individual in producing a particular product. So remember, China can either make 500 toys or 100 t-shirts, whereas Mexico can make either 25 toys or 60 t-shirts here. Now, who has comparative advantage in toy production and who has comparative advantage in in uh, comparative advantage in t-shirt production. So explain why. So what you have to understand is comparative advantage takes into account what you are giving up. So back to the example I gave with, uh, with a student that plays basketball. Um, 
Let's go ahead and, and call that student Jeremy. So Jeremy plays basketball on the high school uh, basketball team at Los Altos. And you have uh, Kobe Bryant. So who has absolute advantage? Again, the student Jeremy would probably say you know, Kobe Bryant. But comparative advantage actually would probably be uh, Jeremy. Uh, because if Jeremy is a student at Los Altos High School, and he decides to play basketball, he's only giving up maybe his free time, maybe another sport, whereas Kobe Bryant would be giving up his NBA career, his reputation. He's giving up a whole lot more than Jeremy, the Los Altos High School student, would be in giving up, uh, in choosing to play for the basketball team. So comparative advantage actually takes into account what you're giving up, not necessarily who's better, who's worse, but what are you giving up? Uh, in, in terms of that uh, equation here. So let's go ahead and work out this problem here. Uh, let's look at China first here. So China can either make 50 toys uh, or 100 t-shirts. So we go ahead and set that equal to each other because they're, they're interchangeable here. So 50, 50 toys will equal 100 t-shirts. Again, we're going to do some math here, but the good thing about economics is that the math here is not going to be difficult at all. It's going to be a lot of equalities and dividing and, and making sure that they're equal to each other. So if you're not the greatest at math, that, that's okay. Just you, under, you have to understand how to use the basic math in order to uh, do this here. So when you ever see an equal sign, that really means opportunity cost. So the opportunity cost of making 50 toys is 100 t-shirts. But we don't care about 50 t-shirts or, or 50 toys or 100 t-shirts. We care about one toy here. So we want to divide by 50 here. So we get one toy equals uh, two t-shirts, right? Now we also want to figure out uh, what the opportunity cost is of one t-shirt. So let's go ahead, instead of dividing by 50 here, let's go ahead and divide by 100. And now what you get is one t-shirt equals one and a half toys. Okay, so what you're what you're seeing right here is um, one toy equals two t-shirts, and one t-shirt equals one and a half toys. So what what you want to make sure to understand is that they are um, they are the reciprocal of of each other. So one t-shirt equals one half toys, one toy equals two t-shirts here, and uh, we'll we'll go ahead and use that shortcut here for Mexico. So Mexico here, on the other hand, Mexico can either make twenty five toys or 60 t-shirts. So let's go ahead and divide here by, by 25 here to get what one toy would equal here. So one toy equals 60 over 25. So if you break that down, that's going to be 2 and, and 10 over 25, which is going to be equal to, um, let me see, 10 over 25 t-shirts. Now, if you break that down, that's going to be 40%, uh, which is 2 over 5. So one toy equals uh, 2 and 2 over 5, which is going to be equal to 12 over 5 t-shirts. So 2 and 2 fifths, which is 12 over 5 here. Now, we could divide by 60 right here to figure out what one t-shirt equals. But actually, an easier way of doing that would be find the reciprocal here. So one t-shirt is going to be the reciprocal of what this is here. So one t-shirt equals 5 over 12 toys. Now, in order to find who has comparative advantage in making toys, well, let's go ahead and take a look here. One toy equals two t-shirts, and one toy equals uh, 12 over 5 t-shirts, or two Two and uh, two and two fifths, right? So this is fairly close here. There's not a huge discrepancy, but uh, China is going to have comparative advantage. China has comparative advantage in in toys. Why? Because because there's a lower opportunity cost. The reason why is that two. Uh, two is actually less than is less than two and two fifths. So two is less than two and two fifths, 
in, in terms of what's being given up in terms of t-shirt production here. So China has comparative advantage in toys here. Now, we don't really even have to work out the other situation who has comparative advantage in t-shirts. We can just say, because China has comparative advantage in toys, Mexico has comparative advantage in t-shirts. Okay. Why? Because you take a look at this, 5 over 12 is actually going to be less than 1 half here. So 5 over 12 toys is less than 1 and a half toys here. So again, comparative advantage is who's giving up less, whether it's in an athletic contest, uh, whether it's in a production contest, whoever whoever's giving up less uh, has comparative advantage. And that really determines why people do what they do. You can basically say that you're doing whatever it is, whether it's giving an economics lecture, whether it's studying for the economics test, is because you have a lower opportunity cost in doing that. So uh, it doesn't necessarily have to apply with only international trade. It could do with individual behavior. We do things because we have a lower opportunity cost and therefore comparative advantage. So comparative advantage, uh, let's go ahead and graph this and, and be able to see how that would actually look using production possibilities frontier. Let's merge these two concepts together here. So we're going to put toys here on the x-axis and we're going to put uh, t-shirts on the y-axis here. So let's say, uh, you know, the, uh, the Chinese can make either 50 toys, 50 toys, so let's put 50 right here. 50 toys or 100 t-shirts here. So it would be constant opportunity cost right here. So it would be, um, this would be China. And then Mexico could be either 25 toys. So let's go ahead and use red for, um, let's go ahead and use red for Mexico. So it'd be 25 toys and either 60 t-shirts here, so 50, it'd be 60. So go ahead, you can go ahead and do this here. Now, we're going to rework this out and we're going to create a comparative advantage table so that when you're, when you're doing these things, you can actually see using a chart rather than just having a bunch of uh, equations set together. So what we want to find out is um, what is the opportunity cost of one um, of one toy, and what is the opportunity cost of one T-shirt? And then this is for China, and this is for Mexico. Again, we we, we worked it out uh, prior to this here. So for China, fifty toys equals one hundred t-shirts and again you want to divide by 50 here so one toy equals two t-shirts here so once you have this here um, you want to fill out this chart so that you don't get confused one toy for China would equal two t-shirts and you want to make sure that you put in two t-shirts because if you put in two you're not going to know what what is actually being given up when you're making a toy you might get confused with, with the labeling. So make sure you put in the label in there here. And the opportunity cost for one t-shirt, remember is the reciprocal of two, which is one and a half toys here. So the opportunity cost here is one and a half, uh, actually this is for, for China still, it would be one and a half toys. Okay, so these two numbers are gonna be reciprocals of each other. So if it's not, then uh, you must have done something wrong here. So with Mexico, it's 25 toys equals 60 t-shirts. So you want to divide by 25 right here. 25. One toy equals, again, two, um, two and two-fifths, which is going to be 12 over 5. 12 over 5 t-shirts. Okay, so we want to do it here. One toy equals 12 over 5 t-shirts. And one t-shirt is going to be the reciprocal, 5 over 12 toys here. So 5 over 12 toys. So when you're trying to figure out who has comparative advantage, well, 2 is going to be less than 12 over 5. And 5 twelfths is actually 
less, 5 twelfths is going to be less than 1 over, 1 over 2. So again, as we established before, China has comparative advantage in making toys because 2 is less than 12 over 5. And Mexico has comparative advantage in t-shirts. So again, China has comparative advantage in toys. And Mexico has a comparative advantage in t-shirts. So yeah, I reworked this problem out, but now I put it into a chart here. So in case the numbers, uh, in, in case you kind of forget, just keep in mind uh, the idea in economics is who has a lower opportunity cost. You're trying to do things to try to max maximize the situation, and the optimal thing to do is to find the lower of the two opportunity costs. So example number one, let's say Matt can make 10 baseballs or, or 5 gloves in one hour, while Andre can make 12 baseballs or 3 gloves in one hour. So determine who has comparative advantage in making baseballs and making gloves. Well, let, let's find the easy thing first here. Who has absolute advantage? So Matt can make 10 baseballs, where Andre can make 12. So Andre has absolute advantage in making baseballs. Um, Andre, Andre can make three, base, 3 gloves in one hour, and Matt can make 5 gloves in one hour. So who has absolute advantage in in making gloves. Well, Matt, so this one's actually really easy. Uh, Matt has absolute advantage in making um, gloves, and Andre has absolute advantage in making in making uh, baseballs. So you can already determine that Matt is going to make gloves, and uh, Andre is going to make baseballs. But again, the reason why isn't because of the absolute advantage, it's because of the comparative advantage. So let's go ahead and work out this uh, equality. Matt, so 10 baseballs is going to equal 5 gloves. So what you have here is you divide by 10 on both sides and you get 1 baseball equals 1 and a half gloves. Again, find the reciprocal which would be 1 glove equals 2 over 1 or just 2 baseballs. Okay. Now you want to go ahead and figure out for uh, Andre and you have 12 baseballs equals 12 baseballs equals 3 gloves and you want to divide by 12 here. So 1 baseball equals 1 over 4 gloves and 1 glove equals 4 baseballs. Now again, you want to create this chart here. So the opportunity cost of one baseball, and you want to find the opportunity cost of one glove, and go ahead and put Matt and Andre right here. And you want to make sure you have a, a chart so that you can compare. So the opportunity cost for Matt here of making uh, one baseball would be half of a glove. And for one glove, it's two baseballs. And in this scenario here, you have the opportunity cost for Andre of making one baseball is going to be one-fourth of a glove. And you're going to also going to have four baseballs right here. So again, we already established this here, but the lower of the two, it's actually easier to compare the whole number if there exists whole numbers rather than the fraction. Well, obviously, two baseballs is less than four baseballs, so Matt has comparative advantage in gloves, which we already established with absolute advantage. And Andre, one-fourth, is less than one-half, so Andre has comparative advantage in baseball. So Matt has comparative advantage in gloves, whereas uh, Andre has comparative advantage in baseballs. So another example, let's say you have two individuals, let's say you have Sarah and then you have Susan. So let's say Sarah can make 10 purses or 5 dresses in one hour, while Susan can make 15 purses or 15 dresses in an hour. Determine who has comparative advantage in making purses and in making dresses. Again, once again, let's find out who has absolute advantage right here. So Sarah can make 10 purses, while Susan can make 
15. So clearly Susan has the uh, absolute advantage in making purses. Why? Because 15 is greater than 10. And she can make 15 dresses and Sarah can only make five. So once again, Susan has absolute advantage. So Susan has absolute advantage in both. But, but the problem is here that you may have situations in which in a business partnership, one person is superior. But keep in mind, when, when Susan is making uh, dresses, she's giving up making purses and vice versa. So Sarah's going to come in handy. And the rule of thumb here is one person can have absolute advantage in both, but one person cannot have comparative advantage in uh, in both situations. It's, it's mathematically not going to be able to work out. So if Susan has comparative advantage in purses, then Sarah will have comparative advantage in dress dresses. And if Susan has comparative advantage in dresses, then Sarah will have comparative advantage in purses. So let's go ahead and, and again work this out here so that you know exactly how to do this. So Sarah, again, 10 purses is going to equal 5 dresses. And you divide by 10. So make this really systematic. This part of the, the AP uh, curriculum isn't going to be the most difficult, but it can get a little bit tedious. So if you practice this over and over again, then you'll get the hang of it here. So one purse is going to equal half, you know, uh, half of a dress, I guess. One purse equals half of a dress. Well, if you find the reciprocal of this, one dress will actually equal two purses. And you do the same thing for Susan here. Find the same equality here. And her, her, her situation is actually really easy here because five purses equal, or 15 purses equal five, 15 dresses. So you have a one-to-one -one ratio here. So you don't really have to, uh, I mean, you can divide here. You're dividing by 15 actually. So one purse equals one dress and one dress equals one purse. It'd be silly to, to rewrite it, but let's go ahead and rewrite it. One dress equals one purse. So again, you, you set this equation up here. So the opportunity cost of one dress and the opportunity cost of one purse. And you have Sarah and you have Susan. And now you're just filling in, uh, filling in the, uh, uh, the columns right here. So for Sarah, the opportunity cost of one purse is half of a dress and or half of a dress right here. And the opportunity cost of one dress for Sarah would equal two purses. Now, if you look at Susan, the opportunity cost of one dress would equal one purse. And the opportunity cost of one purse would equal one dress. So who has comparative advantage? Well, Sarah, Sarah is giving up two purses to make one dress, where Susan's only giving up one purse right here. So this is lower. So Susan, so Susan has comparative advantage in making... Uh, Susan has comparative advantage in dresses or making dresses. Whereas uh, Sarah has comparative advantage in making purses. Why? Because one half of a dress is less than one dress. So Sarah has comparative advantage in purses. I mean, you could, if you weren't, uh, able to remember how to work out this equality, one way you can actually do this is that, okay, Sarah can make 10 purses and she can make five dresses. Whereas Susan, you know, she's kind of indifferent. She's making, you know, you know, one purse or one dress. But you know what? Sarah is relatively better at making purses than dresses. So Sarah would have comparative advantage in purses and Susan would have comparative advantage in dresses. And that's exactly what we get right here. So if you are a little bit confused with how to do this here, then sometimes you can use the numbers that are given to figure out who has comparative advantage using some, some logic. So another example uh, would be below is the production possibilities frontier uh, for country A. So let's say you have country A and country B. Who has comparative advantage in steak and in chicken? So let's say that uh, you have country A. Um, you know, let's go ahead and, and use different names for these countries here. Let's a country that starts with an A, Australia. So let's say country A is Australia. Let's spell it correctly here. And country B, let's say it's Belgium. Okay, so who has comparative advantage in steak and chicken? Well, 
uh, if you see here, there's no numbers here. So it's, a, it's, a, it's going to be a little bit, well, how can I actually do this here? You can't set them equal to each other. Um, and it's a little bit problematic here. So I want you to be able to actually tackle this problem with actually being able to uh, set the equalities to each other. Use a little common sense here and see who has a higher opportunity cost. Use your knowledge of production possibilities frontier. Well, right here, the steeper the curve, okay, so what you have is here, the steeper the curve, the greater the opportunity cost. So clearly, in Australia right here, the, the curve here is steeper than it is in Belgium, which is a relatively flatter opportunity cost. So, so steak, in order to produce more steak, there's a lot of chicken that is actually big, being given up in order to produce steak in Australia. Whereas in Belgium, it appears that you know uh, much more steak can be um, can be produced. So the opportunity cost of making steak is actually less than in uh, Australia. So based on this here, Belgium has comparative advantage in steak. And Australia has comparative advantage in chicken. And again, the way I saw this here is that there's a greater opportunity cost. So the production possibilities um, frontier here is much steeper, so the opportunity cost is higher in country A than it is country B. So the country that has a, a, a flatter slope will have comparative advantage uh, in the x-axis good. So conversely, the steeper, the steeper slope is going to have comparative advantage in the y-axis. So so country A or Australia has comparative advantage in chicken and country B or Belgium has comparative advantage in steak. So that's one way to figure out comparative advantage without even doing the math here. So if you're more graphically oriented, then you might be able to use this trick, particularly on a multiple choice question where you might not have enough time to work this out. Obviously, if you have time to work it out mathematically, uh, then this method is not required, but this is a shortcut uh, that can be used, again, if you know exactly uh, if, if the curve is to scale or if you know that uh, numbers-wise that they produce the same amount of chicken, then you can actually draw it and, and figure out for yourself who has comparative advantage. Uh, on, on certain questions where you can't visually see it, then the best alternative might be to actually work it out. Another example is the production possibilities for Daniel and David, uh, who has comparative advantage in pizza and and bobblehead. So uh, David and Daniel, they're both uh, trying to figure out uh, what to make in terms of pizza or bobbleheads here. Now, uh, Daniel here um, can make either, uh, let's take a look here. So Daniel can make either 30 pizzas or 100 bobbleheads, whereas David can make 50 or 400. Okay, well this one's a little bit harder to to visualize here. This is maybe not, I mean, it, it, I tempted to make this to scale, but you can kind of see that this one's a little bit steeper. So Daniel would have, or David has the flatter of the two slopes, so David has comparative advantage in making bobbleheads, and Daniel would have comparative advantage in making pizza. But again, we're not quite sure because it's not as apparent as the previous example. So let's go ahead and work it out here. Let's see if this, uh, my trick to, to, to see which one has comparative advantage actually works out when you work it out mathematically. So let's take a look at Daniel right here. So Daniel's situation is 30 pizza equals 100 baubles. In this case, it's uh, the legendary Vin Scully bobblehead here. So divided by 30, so you have one pizza equals uh, 100 over 30 bobbleheads. So that would be 10 over 3 bobbles, which is a shortened way of saying uh, bobbleheads here. And one bobble equals the reciprocal of this, equals 3 over 10 pizzas. Okay. Now let's go ahead and see from the perspective of David. So David here 
Now 50 pizza for him equals 400 baubles. And if you want to find the opportunity cost of one pizza, you divide by 50 and you get one pizza equals uh, one pizza equals, uh, you know, this would be actually eight baubles. Eight over one. And one, let's see, go ahead and use a different color here. One bobblehead would equal one over eight baubles, or one over eight pizza, sorry. So let's go ahead and draw a chart here. So the opportunity cost of one pizza and the opportunity cost of one bobble and the two uh, individuals is uh, Daniel and David. So again, the chart is good to organize information so that you're comparing rather than looking at a, a jumbled mass. So for organizational purposes, I highly recommend that you draw an opportunity cost uh, chart so that you're able to organize the information and then make the decision from there here. So one pizza equals 10 thirds of a bobble for Daniel. So 10 over 3 bobble. And one bobble equals 3 over 10 pizza for, um, for Daniel. So one bobble equals 3 over 10 pizza. Okay. Now for, uh, for David, one pizza equals 8 bobbles. And one bobble is equals one, 1 over 8 pizza here. Now again, it's easier to, uh, when you're dealing with fractions, it might be a little bit harder. I think this is fairly apparent here. But David's opportunity cost of making pizza is 8 bobbles, whereas Daniel, it's only 10 over 3. So Daniel has comparative advantage, just like it was predict predicted here. Daniel has comparative advantage in making pizza. So Daniel has comparative advantage in making pizza. Okay, so Daniel is going to be the one making this uh, nice pepperoni pizza right here. And uh, 1 over 8 is less than, 1 over 8 pizzas is less than 3 over 10. So when David is making a bobblehead, he's giving a production of 1 eighth of a pizza, whereas Daniel is giving up 3 tenths of a pizza. So clearly David is uh, more suited to make the bobbleheads. So he's only giving up 1 eighth of a pizza here. So David here is comparative advantage in making bobbles. So Daniel would, should really focus here on the pizza aspect of the business, whereas David here is, uh, is the more uh, valuable component in making uh, you know, these Vin Scully bobbleheads. Uh, so again, let's take a look at another example. Uh, this time, let's look at two different countries. Let's say you have Korea and China here. So comparative advantage, let's say that in terms of making steel, um, Korea can make 15 and China can make 10, whereas in copper, uh, Korea can make 60, and China can make 60. Refer to the table above uh, to answer the following questions. These two countries are producing steel and copper using equal amounts of resources. What is the opportunity cost of producing steel for each country? What is the opportunity cost of producing copper for each country? And which country has comparative advantage in steel and copper? So again, this is Exactly the same thing here, but now instead of dealing with two individuals, now we're dealing with two different countries. So let's create some more space to work out this particular problem here. But um, let's go ahead and cheat first here. So without doing any of the math, you see that Korea and China both make 60. So they can both make 60 here. So they are basically equal in making copper. But guess what? Korea is relatively better because they can make 15 units and China can make 10. So we can really stop right there and say, um, uh, so blank has comparative advantage in making steel and blank has comparative advantage in making copper. Now again, I, I just stop right there because since they're equal at making copper and China or Korea is relatively better at making steel, again, my prediction here is that Korea is going to have comparative advantage in making steel. So Korea has comparative advantage in making steel, whereas China has comparative advantage in making copper. Now let's see if, uh, once we work out the problem, if this is what we get. Again, this is a, it's a nice shortcut if you have 
two countries making the same exact, then you can kind of deduce which country has comparative advantage without doing all of the work. But again, chances are if this is an FRQ problem, you're going to have plenty of time to work it out. So why not double check and, and make sure that you're right here. So let's take a look here in Korea. 15 steel units of steel is going to equal 60 units of copper. Now let's go ahead and divide uh, divide here by 15 here. So you get one steel equals four copper. And therefore the reciprocal one copper equals one over four steel. And take a look at China here. This here is 10 steel equals 60 copper and divide by 10 and you get one steel equals six copper and find the reciprocal here. So one copper equals one over six steel. So let's go ahead and, and draw this chart out to make sure that uh, you understand. So here's the opportunity cost of one uh, steel and the opportunity cost of one copper. And the two individuals here are, or the two countries here are Korea and China. So let's see this played out here in a chart. Yeah, we have, we have all the information. Now it's just putting it into the, uh, into the chart to figure out if what we have is actually correct here. So in Korea, the opportunity cost of one steel would be four copper. And the opportunity cost of one copper equals one fourth of a steel. So we have the information now for Korea. Now you look for China here. One steel equals six copper. And one copper equals one over six steel here. Again, make sure, again, this seem like a, this might seem like a small thing, but if you don't have the labeling, you're going to get confused and you're not going to be able to make sense of, uh, of what the point is in doing these math equations. Again, the point of doing this really isn't about the math. It's to organize and understand where the opportunity costs are. So the opportunity cost is four copper to make one steel in Korea and six copper. So four is less than six. So, if the predictions I made were true, then Korea should have comparative advantage in making steel. And lo and behold, it checks out. Four is less than six. Korea's comparative advantage in making steel. And therefore, China, one over six, is less than one over four. So China has comparative advantage in making copper. So in terms of trade, uh, Korea is going to trade in what has comparative advantage. So Korea is going to make steel and it will export steel. Whereas China has comparative advantage in copper and China will export copper and import steel. And conversely, obviously, uh, Korea is going to export steel but import copper. So this is a fairly extensive problem when you're going to deal with specialization, trade, uh, it could be production possibilities frontier with constant opportunity costs and comparative advantage. Finally, we're going to look at a problem uh, using a multiple choice. And again, we're going to use that technique. How are we going to use the knowledge of production possibilities frontier and comparative advantage to tackle uh, a problem on the AP exam? Now again, keep in mind that the AP exam, 67%, two thirds of the exam is actually weighted on the multiple choice exam. So it's great if you know how to draw the graphs and the FRQs, but if you're not able to analyze a multiple choice problem, then chances are you're not going to get that five on the AP exam. So let's take a look at this example here. In India, a car can be produced by eight workers in one day and a computer by three workers in one day. In the U.S., a car can be produced by eight workers in one day and a computer by two workers in one day. Which of the following statements uh, is false here, not in false? Which of the following statements here is going to be false? All right, so one of the things that you want to do is you want to try to figure out, are there any shortcuts? I mean, you can actually find this equality, but uh, you probably don't want to spend more than uh, maybe a minute or two on this problem. So 
Uh, this one's kind of tricky because you're going to find four true statements and you got to find the false one here. So neither country has absolute advantage in making computers. Um, well, let's go ahead and, and kind of uh, see if we have any shortcuts here. So in eight workers is used to make uh, uh, a car or three workers are, is used to make a computer. Um, and in the U.S., eight workers are used to make a computer. Um, and two workers are are used to uh, or two or eight workers are used to make a car. I'm sorry, and two workers are used to make a computer. So what you see here is that in India, a car requires eight workers, and in the U.S., a car also uh, uses eight workers. So they're equal. So the production is equal, and assuming the quality is the same, then you you have a tie here. So what's interesting is that. In India, a computer requires three workers, whereas in the United States, it only requires two workers. So right there, you stop right there. U.S. has a comparative advantage, has a comparative advantage in making computers. You just stop right there because they're equal at making cars, and the U.S. is relatively better at making computers. You just stop right there, and you figure that out here. If the U.S. has comparative advantage in computers, then what goes to reason is that India has a comparative advantage in cars. Okay, so neither um, now. So let's find the four true statements and find the false one here. So neither country has absolute advantage in making computers. Uh, let's take a look at that. Neither country has absolute advantage in making computers. So uh, one computer. Um, eight, a car can be produced by eight workers and a computer can be produced by three workers here. Eight workers for a car and uh, a computer by two workers right here. Uh, this, is actually, this is actually false. So we can already figure out that this is actually false here. The U.S. has absolute advantage in making cars. Is that a true statement here? Well, neither has. So this is, uh, um, this is also... The U.S. has absolute advantage in making cars. Uh, that's false. The U.S. has comparative advantage in making cars. Uh, no, the U.S. has comparative advantage in making computers and not cars. So this is also false. The U.S. has comparative advantage in making computers. That is absolutely true. And India has comparative advantage in making cars. That is also true. Um, India's comparative advantage in making cars. Okay, that is also true here. All right. So actually, this example, um, which of the following statements is false here? What you have here is that this here is the false statement. This here is the false statement. This here is the false statement. But these are true statements here. So again, you're not going to see a question like this on the AP exam because you're going to have multiple choice words A, B, C, D, or E. Uh, but in this case, you have three false statements and you have two true statements. Thank you for watching educator.com.